Well, we are here to focus on Jesus, and as we've been reading the Gospel of John, how He came into the world. And so, we want to remember that when we celebrate Christmas, we are celebrating Christ. So, maybe sometimes you see the signs around that say, keep Christ in Christmas. Um, I think the tone of those signs is a bit unnecessarily confrontational, personally, but um, it's kind of an anti-Christmas tone when you think about it. However, there is a point there. We do want to keep Christ in our affections at Christmas. And so, the question, whether you like the signs or not, is this, who is the Jesus that we're here to adore? Who is the Christ that we celebrate at Christmas? Who do you actually think He is? What comes into your mind when you think about Jesus? Plenty are quick to keep Christ in Christmas, but which Christ are we keeping there? Which Christ is in your mind? Who do we think He really is? So, who is He? That's the big question. We'll take a few minutes to answer tonight. So, think about the Christmas story. The skies open, angels praise God, shepherds gather. Wise men are traveling from foreign lands to worship and honor this newborn child. As a toddler, Herod, a local ruler, wants to put him to death. When he rose, his followers were committed to his cause that they gave their lives for him, and they changed the Roman world and then the global world to the point that now we live 2,000 years later on the other side of the globe and we're celebrating Christmas. Even people who don't think about Jesus the rest of the year will set up nativities in their homes. So, here's the question at Christmas. What kind of child provokes that kind of response at His entrance to the world and that kind of response that continues even to today? So, we want to know the real Jesus, and the real Jesus is worthy of far more than a yearly celebration. He's not the kind of person that we make a holiday for and then ignore. 19th century Scottish pastor named Robert Murray McShane wrote this, and this is my hope for tonight for all of us. He said this, learn much about the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty and yet such meekness and grace, and all for sinners, even the chief. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ and all that is in Him. So, we want to know and trust and enjoy the real Jesus tonight. So, we'll do this by looking at the first paragraph to the book of Hebrews. Little paragraph, and it shows us who the real Jesus is. It's one of the most dense and most amazing description of Jesus ever written, and it answers the question, who is this child, and why is He worthy of not just Christmas celebrations, but our whole lives of worship? And it gives seven amazing realities about Jesus, seven insights about who this little baby in the manger really is. So, I'll read it, then we'll walk through it. It says this, here's God's Word. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Jesus, He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to the angels as the name He has inherited is more excellent than theirs." So, seven amazing realities about Jesus. Let's consider them together. Number one, He is the final revelation of God. This is the first line. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, 
He has spoken to us by His Son. So there's a contrast here. So you and I are plotted here in history. Rewind about 2,000 years, Jesus came. Before that, the author's saying God spoke in many different ways and at many different times. He spoke through prophets. He spoke through visions. He spoke through angelic visitations. But now, He has revealed Himself in a singular way, and it's through Jesus. And notice it's in Jesus Himself that this revelation comes. Jesus, who He is, what He's done is God's ultimate message to this world. So many people don't believe there is a God, and they say that the virgin birth of Jesus is a miracle that's just a bit too much. It's too radical to believe. So if that's where you're at, um, I can understand. But here's something to consider. Here's how one person put it. Christians believe in the virgin birth of Jesus. Atheists believe in the virgin birth of the universe. Choose your miracle. So, um, I, in other words, everyone has to pick their miracle. So, I say that sincerely to consider. Um, what kind of miracle do you believe in? You either believe that God has created the world, and if He's created the world, and you believe that much, it's certainly not too much to think that He could have Jesus come into the world through a virgin. And if you don't believe God created the world, where did we all come from? How do you explain a world filled of, with love and meaning, purpose, glory, morality, justice? So here's the question, if God is there, and you're willing to consider that, what is He like? A lot of people think that He must be nitpicky and clamoring for attention. Either He's like that, or uh, He is kind of an aw shucks God who's just happy if we pay attention to Him. But Jesus is how we see what God is like. God has spoken in these last days through Jesus, His Son, and so that means Jesus is showing us what God is like. If you wonder what God is like, learn about Jesus. There is no God in heaven behind Jesus who is unlike Jesus. Jesus reveals God to us in all His wisdom, in all His power, in all His goodness, in all His mercy and justice and love. That's what God is like. God has spoken to us through Jesus. He interrupted history at Advent by sending Jesus and speaking to the world. And He has interrupted so many of your lives in this room by speaking Jesus into your own heart. And may He interrupt our lives tonight as well by revealing Jesus to us. So, who is the baby in the manger? That is… that's right. <laughs> End of sermon. Closed. <sighs> yep. And He is God's final revelation to us. Well, end of point one. I have seven to go. Usually I have like three or four, and it takes like 35, 40 minutes. So we're going to be here a while if I have seven. <laughs> Kidding. Uh, that, I think that was the longest point, actually. So, uh, Second, He's the heir of all things. So that's the next phrase, whom He appointed heir of all things. So heirs are children who have an inheritance coming. Some of you have an inherited money or land or possessions, Jesus is appointed to inherit everything, which means everything you have inherited or everything you will inherit, uh, Jesus is actually the owner of. He is the heir of all things. The backdrop of this statement is Psalm 2, which says, a king will come from King David's line and inherit the nations. All things will be given to him, and he'll rule the world with justice and goodness. This means that the baby in that manger would one day be enthroned over all things, and that has already begun. He is reigning right now. His kingdom has come. We look forward to the consummation in the future, but He is now reigning. Third, He's the creator of the world. That's the next phrase, through whom He also created the world. When we think of Jesus, we shouldn't just think of Him as a Savior, especially if we have just kind of a narrow religious category for that kind of idea. He's the creator of all things. This means that there's no corner of your life that Jesus is irrelevant toward. There's not an ultimate divide between things that are sacred and things that are secular. Jesus isn't just relevant for Christian worship services like this. He created the trees that are used to 
build your house. If you have a real tree in your family room, he made that tree. Uh, He has made everything. He created the snow that may or may not come down this winter. He created the sun that thankfully will warm this place up again. So this is about Jesus' birth. That means the baby that created the ground that he is, the manger is sitting on is in that manger. He created the sky that was overhead that then opened up with the angels praising God. Fourth, he's the radiance of God's glory. It's hard to find another phrase in the Bible that says anything stronger than verse 3 says about Jesus' identity. Who is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. Radiance is about splendor, brightness, shining beauty. So Jesus is the reflection of or the outshining of God's radiant glory. And he's the exact representation of God. He shares the divine nature. He's truly God and truly human. Jesus came at Advent to reveal that glory, and he revealed it in an unexpected way. He came not in radiant splendor that we would see with our eyes, but wrapped in swaddling cloths. He came in humility, showing us that that's actually where glory shines. And that message would continue through his life all the way to the cross, where the cross itself, where people see anything but glory, that's actually where glory shines. Because it's at the cross where we see the love and mercy and justice and goodness of God shining most brightly for sinners like us. He reveals glory through humility. This leads fifth to he's the sustainer of the universe. Verse 3, upholding all things by the word of his power. Why are all things in this room holding together right now? Why is gravity working right now? Why do neutrons and protons and electrons work? Why is everything not just disintegrating or imploding or separating? Because Jesus is actively holding all things together. And he has always actively held all things together. The amazing mystery of Advent is that he was doing that even as a baby. Jesus did not cease being God when he came to this world as a human. He did not trade his divinity for humanity. Instead, he added a human nature to his divine nature. He remained truly God while adding to himself a human nature. And so he continued to uphold the universe even then. This is a mystery that Christians have worked to articulate through church history. One of the fourth century church fathers named Athanasius wrote about this. His classic work on this is called On the Incarnation. Great little book. I commend it to you. Listen to how he put it. The Word, referring to Jesus, like John 1 in the reading we had earlier refers to him, the Word was not hedged in by his body, nor did his presence in the body prevent his being present elsewhere at all. When he moved his body, he did not cease also to direct the universe by his mind and might. At one and the same time, this is the wonder, as man, he was living a human life, and as word, he was sustaining the life of the universe. Sixth, he's the priest who saves. Verse 3 adds, making purification for sins. So, Jesus' rejection, his suffering, and his death, those were not a surprise. He did not come in glory as the creator and sustainer of all things and then find shock when people didn't receive him. He came to a world he knew would reject him because the world already rejected God from the beginning. He came to redeem the world. He was born to die, as we saw this morning. He came because this triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is a triune God of love and the very source of all real love. And so Jesus came to rescue and redeem sinners like us. And as the Son of God, He created the world, and He sustains the world, and He revealed His glory, but we have been ungrateful to Him. 
Because of this, we have become, the Bible says, spiritually unclean. We need to be spiritually cleansed and purified of our sin and guilt. And Jesus came to purify us. He was born so that He could die, and He died so that you could be cleansed. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Jesus came to us so that He could die for us, so that we could be with Him forever. This is why we celebrate Christmas. And this is true of all who are united to Him by faith. Finally, He is the King over all things. Verses 3 and 4. He sat down. So this is after His life, death, resurrection, ascension. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, becoming as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So he entered the world as an embryo, and he was born, and he lived a faithful life, and he died on the cross for us. He rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. The disciples saw him go up. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father, a metaphor for taking the place of kingship and authority and rule and power. And that's the name he's inherited, the name of Lord and King over all things. He's reigning over creation now. And so this is the Jesus that you and I are invited to trust and adore and follow. He's the final revelation of God. He is the heir of of all things. He is the creator of everything in the whole world. He is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of His nature. He's the sustainer of the universe. He's the priest who saves us, and He is the King over all things. This is not the kind of person that is fit merely for Hallmark cards. Uh, This is not the kind of person that we just give a couple holidays to. This is the kind of person that we trust in all things. The kind of person that we should cultivate a sense of awe toward every day. The kind of person we should long to get to know. The kind of person we follow and submit all of life to. The kind of person we sing to. So, If you're here and this is all new to you, or maybe you've known this, but you have not trusted in the risen Lord Jesus, this is the real Jesus, and He invites you and even commands you to come to Him, to trust Him for the forgiveness of your sins, to submit to Him as the King over all things. So perhaps tonight you would pray to Him, and you would draw near to Him, and you would ask for Him to forgive you and you'd submit to Him. Confess your sins, receive His purifying work, submit to Him as your Creator, the Sustainer, and the King over all things. And for all of us, let's hold on to this Jesus. This is the real Jesus. We hold on to Him even as our culture rejects Him, and most are not rejecting the real Jesus, but a version of Jesus that's nothing like the one that we've seen tonight. They've not yet learned that this is the real Jesus. And so, just end with one encouragement, same one I ended this morning. Who's one person in your life who needs to hear about the real Jesus? Who's one person in your life that you can pray for to come to know this Jesus? And what's one step you can take to help them learn about this Jesus that they might find the ever-increasing joy of knowing Him? Let's pray together. Father, we come to you in the name of the risen Lord Jesus. We thank you for Christmas, Advent. Lord Jesus, we praise you as the radiance of God's glory. We praise you as the exact imprint of his nature. We praise you as the creator of all things and the heir of all things and the sustainer of all things and the king of over all things, and the purifying priest and sacrifice for all who would be united to you by faith. Lead our hearts to adore you now. Amen. So we